Hello, and thank you for joining me on my program. Tonight, I'm continuing with a teaching series on miracles and healings. You know, I've mentioned each week, if you know of someone that's in need of a miracle or in need of a physical touch, I'm just asking you to continue to invite them to come in and listen to these series. I don't know how long the Lord will ask me to continue on with this one theme, miracles and healings. But as long as he keeps pouring those messages into my spirit, I'm going to keep right on. So tonight in that theme, my title is Four Steps to a Miracle. Four Steps to a Miracle. These are so critical that if one was left out, we could be blocked from receiving our miracle. Well, if they're that important, let's dig in tonight and find out what those four steps are. The first one, and this is found in the book of Mark chapter 11. That's where I began to see these four steps. Mark chapter 11. The very first step is, you could almost guess it, have faith in God. But there's a test for having faith in God. And it goes something like this. Are you able to ask yourself or say to yourself, it shall come to pass? It shall come to pass. You see, when we're looking for a miracle and we say, oh, I, I have faith. But if we can't say with an assurance, it's going to happen, it will come to pass then we're missing out on the faith portion because that's the language of faith. Beginning in Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Now the next day when they, Jesus' disciples, had come out of Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of the figs. So we see Jesus, he's come out uh, of Jerusalem with the, the disciples. They're, they're hungry, he's hungry. He looks across the field and there's a fig tree. Fig trees are very unique in appearance. They have a great big leaf and you can see them from a distance. And knowing that it had leaves, he goes over to that fig tree. Now, I did some research because it said that he went to the fig tree, but it was not the season for the fig tree. So I thought, well, why would that be such a problem if it wasn't a season? Why would you worry about it? But when I did the research, I found out that the fig tree leaf and the fig tree fruit start at the same time. Unlike our apple tree or other trees, the leaf and the fruit both sprout at the same time. Now it would have been, it said it's not the season. They wouldn't have been ripe yet, but they would have been there. There was no fruit on this tree. Verse 14 of the 11th chapter of Mark, in response, Jesus said to it, to that tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Now they had been going and on the way he sees this. Now they go on into Jerusalem. And we know of the story there. Jesus goes into the temple and I'm not going to teach that piece. What I want to look at is now in verse 20, now in the morning. So this was yesterday. Now we're in the morning. As they passed by, they, they, the disciples, saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Notice the word dried up from the root. Folks, when God does something, he leaves no room for doubt. You can't explain it. You see, if the leaves had just curled up and shriveled up, we could have said, oh, it was an exceptionally hot day or 
maybe the wind, something that would create that dried up leaf. But this, a beautiful tree one day, dried up and withered away the next morning from the root, the root system. There was no way to explain it. Verse 21, and Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Remember the disciples heard what he spoke to that tree. A lot of times when Jesus spoke to something, there was a time span between. In this case, it was only 24 hours, but it's enough to understand that it didn't happen instantaneously. They heard him speak to that tree. Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. The next day they saw the result of the word spoken by Jesus. This is the word, folks, right here. If we began to speak the word, there may be a time, but it will come to pass. Verse 22, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Jesus gave us step one. Next, I said, or, or can, maybe we can say something like, it shall come to pass. Notice what, that, what Jesus did in this miracle. He didn't sit there underneath that tree and wait for it to happen. He didn't say, well, guys, y'all go on. I'm, I've spoke this. I'm not moving until it happens. No, he went on into town, take care of some business. And in fact, when they come back the next day, it's not Peter, it's not Jesus that says, oh, look, the tree that I spoke to yesterday, look at it, it's dead now from the roots. That's Peter. Peter is the one that brings the subject up. Jesus didn't bring it up. Why? He knew it was going to happen. He had faith in God to do his word. He had faith in God. Jesus didn't hang around to watch it, and he wasn't the one to check on the tree afterward. Others did. Others will watch. Whatever comes out of your mouth, they'll look. Has it happened yet? Have, has it happened? Peter going by that same tree, and there it is. It doesn't look anything like it looked yesterday. Look, there's the tree that he spoke. Have faith in God was Jesus' answer. Another thing about this miracle that's noteworthy, I said it didn't happen instantaneously. I wonder how many people you have prayed to the Lord for something that you feel that you must have, you need, and we're not willing or understanding that so often in the miracles there was a time span from the time spoken to the time received. Don't give up on God or your miracles. Whenever you ask the Lord for something, you hold on, hold on with a tenacity. Jesus knew that he had the power to speak it. Do you realize and do you know that as God's son, you have that same power? He said to us, you can look at your mountain. What is your mountain today? What problem are you facing today? You can look at that mountain, see it, and say, okay, now we've got two things going on. Look at it. You see it. You say to it, be thou removed, cast into the sea. What authority are we given to do that? the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus gives us that authority. There's another little mini 
teaching that I'm not really going to go in today, but I can tell you that there's a whole lesson in being a tree without fruit. God expects us as his children to be like him, productive, creative, fruitful. And that tree was not. Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I like this because it says, believe that you receive them and you will have them. The word will is put in there. Now, will is kind of a time span piece. It's, it's like stretching it out. Believe is now, that you have it now, and you will have it. Let me read it to you again, because if you get this piece that I'm reading right here, you will have spiritual peace in your struggle. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, now, we know when we pray, we are to pray according to the outline of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we're praying the word of God. We're praying in alignment when we ask with God's will, not our will, God's will. So he said, when you pray, believe that you receive them. I've got it and you will have them, and you will have them. So go ahead and receive it in your mind, in your heart, and in your spirit. You will have it. Now, I said there was four steps. Let's look at the step number two, forgiveness and prayer. Wow. Forgiveness. Verse 25, you see, I read 24 to you just now. Verse 25 begins with an and. Now, an and is a connector to whatever it was before that. And, he says, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. It seems like I've been hitting on forgiveness every single message. If we could grasp that without forgiveness, well, without forgiveness from the Father, we don't have salvation. You see, we have to first be forgiven, and God gives forgiveness when we ask him to come into our heart and to forgive us of our sins and say, Father, I want to serve you all the days of my life, well, then we come under his kingdom and his kingdom operates in the arena of forgiven. We are forgiven. But if we, if we won't forgive, then we don't belong under the arena of forgiveness. Does that make sense? There is so an action on our part that God the Father, a very loving Father, that He expects from His children, a behavior that He expects from His children. We are to forgive. If we cannot forgive, then we are not forgiven. And if we are not forgiven, then the covenants of God to us are literally broken. You see, we have to be under the covenant to receive these blessings. And so we can block all of that with a spirit of unforgiveness. Oh, I've, I've heard so many people tell me I was really, really hurt. Um, you don't understand what I went through. No, I don't. I can't possibly begin to understand but I do understand what God said. And it's not with an exception of. 
It is a blanket across the board. We must forgive. We must forgive in order to be forgiven, in order to live under that forgiven arena that he puts all of his children in, everyone forgiven as he forgave us. You know, another thing is, he said, but if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. It's pretty hard to stand in the presence of God and asking him for a miracle. And he looks at us and he says, well, how about so-and-so? Are you going to forgive? Oh, I'm not going to ever forgive that one. But I need you to do such and such for me, Father. Now, I'm making this real simple, but you know what? That's as basic as I can get it because that's what we're doing. We, we want to say, well, no, you don't understand. I, I do understand to a great degree that my Father is able to give us grace greater than all our sins. He can give us grace and he has given us mercy. And we must show mercy. We must go to him for grace that's sufficient above and beyond for us to be able to forgive. Step number three, remember we're trying to get a miracle. We're trying to get a healing, what we need but there are conditions that we must also look at in order not to have our miracle blocked. And it's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 24. I'm going to call it, check your light source. Check your light source. Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is in darkness, how great is that darkness? We need a light to guide us. I'm going to give you just a little example that I thought of. If we go into a theater or, or someplace we're not familiar with and we step in and suddenly all lights are out. The drapes are pulled shut. There is no light coming in. And, but we know we're supposed to go to the other side. We begin to make our way alone. We begin to make our way. And before long, we've, we've stumped our toe on something. And we're, we're bumping into something. And then we start hearing noises and we begin to think, is somebody else in here? What's going on? And we bump and our heart begins to race a little faster and we feel uncomfortable. There's no light in here. And we keep trying to move it, we're bumping and our heart's racing and we're thinking, is somebody else, are you in here? We're miserable. You see, our eyes could see no light to guide us. But if someone turned on that light in that same unfamiliar room and we were to get to the other side, the lights are on. Now we can see everything and we don't bump into things. We can maneuver, we can walk. We can move from side to side unhindered. We hear a noise. We look around to see that, oh, hi, so-and-so is also entering. They're good. The things that we fear the most are the things that we don't see because of the darkness. God says, I don't want you to have a light, an eye that's filled with darkness. The only way I could think of to have a light, uh, an eye filled with darkness was to be in that room filled with darkness. That's all my eye could take in. What is darkness? Darkness is like death. It's like doubt, unbelief. You see, those are all shades of darkness. It's fear, 
that's a shade of darkness. When our eyes began to take in the, the doctor's report, and it says things that bring, could bring fear. Our eye is bringing in what we show it. What are you looking toward? What are you putting before your eyes? Are you putting the word of God before your eyes? This is light. It is a lamp unto our feet. This is the directional course. This is the plan this is light. Jesus Christ is light. Are you looking unto him for your source? Are you looking unto him like, be the light to my feet. Guide me with your light. I'll follow and I'll stay in the light. There's darkness, there's darkness. I'm walking in the light. So in order to get that miracle that we need, we have to focus on the Word of God. We have to focus on staying in the presence of God. He is light, the very light of heaven. Matthew 6, 24, we've all heard it. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and, and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's the same principle. You can't have light and darkness at the same time. If you have a dark room and you bring a flashlight in, guess what? You don't have darkness. You've got light. We are in the same boat. We choose which master we will serve. And we can't have them both. We can only have one, but we will have one. We will serve light or dark. We will serve light or dark. I choose light tonight. Do you? Have you chosen light? And when you choose light, you can see the miracle. God will show you visions. He will show you that his word will come to pass. It will come to pass if you'll choose light. And our step four, I bet you've heard sermons on this one. Don't worry. Trust God's word for yourself. Don't worry. Trust God's word for yourself. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You know, we many have laid awake, even this last night, worried about something that you don't have a control over. You don't have control. You feel helpless. In reality, you do have control. If Jesus could tell his disciples, look to that mountain and be thou removed and cast into the sea, that sounds like control to me. That mountain looked ominous. We go around mountains. We go over mountains. We go through mountains and under mountains, but we don't move them. We work within them and around them. We try to take our problems, we try to go over them, around them, through them. We don't say, get yourself out of here. We don't do it unless we know the God that we serve, unless we have the source of light, and unless we know that when we say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, mountain, you get up and you move, and then you go on like Jesus did. You don't need to look back. We've commanded it in the name of Jesus. We did it according to thy kingdom, not our kingdom. When we operate in the kingdom, this kingdom, this earthly kingdom, and the problems that come with it have to bow and obey. And so I said, don't worry, just trust God. 
Jesus gave so many examples. He said, you know, let's see if I can find another one. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, he said, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they do? You know, I have these little cute bird hangers outside in our trees. My husband will fill them up with the bird seed and we'll watch the birds. Some days I, if the bird seed gets low, I tell Jack, oh, we need to put some more, we being Jack, put some more bird seed in so we can watch these birds. But what if there was no bird feeder? My heavenly father feeds them. He just lets me interact with them but they were fed and would be fed with or without me. My father knows how to take care of them. And he said, aren't you of more value than all the birds? Yes, he created you in his likeness. The birds he made for all of our enjoyment, but you were made for his pleasure. You were made in his likeness for his pleasure. Don't worry. Verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature? We don't add to our height when we worry. We pull ourselves down and we shorten ourselves. If anything, we become stooped with worry. We become headachey and stomach ache and everything else with worry. If you want a miracle tonight, I want you to go back and look at what I've just said. Have faith in God. It will come to pass. Make sure you've forgiven everyone. Don't hold anyone back. Check your focus. Are you looking to the light source, the word? Are you claiming your scriptures? Don't worry about earthly things, folks. God's got it. He knows what you have need of before you ask. He just wants you to ask. If we could lay aside the worries, lay aside the fears, they are not light sources. They are darkness. Jesus said, whatever things are pure and lovely and of good report, think on these things. This is pure. This is lovely. And there is a good report. I will see you next week with another report. We hope you've enjoyed Kingdom Ministries with Reverend Dee Levins. For more from Dee, read The Long, Long Night, The Story of Destiny, and Echoes from God, a Christian study book for growing deep and strong in the faith. Connect with Dee and purchase her books at dlevins.com. Send an email to dlevinstv at gmail.com or text Dee at 254-681-6099.